so first of all, thank you very much for uh, joining me. I appreciate it. You know, it's after lunch. I've been here uh, just like you yesterday, so I'm pretty sure I have like half an hour of your attention before you all fall asleep. So I'll try to make use of that time. Um, so uh, my name is Alon, as I said, and uh, today we'll talk about contract testing and um, how we use those at SoundCloud to increase our uh, confidence in deploying our services. So a little bit about myself. Um, I, I joined SoundCloud one and a half years ago um, as a backend engineer. I mostly do Scala, uh, some Go, Ruby, depends on the needs. Um, I'm part of the uh, discovery cluster well, where we help our users discover and find content on our platform. So what's SoundCloud? Uh, well, it's a cloud full of sounds. Um, we have around 135 million tracks on the platform and uh, around uh, 175 million unique users a month. And our creators and artists uh, upload around 12 hours of content every minute. Um, and we run approximately 300 plus services. Uh, these are managed by around 50 plus engineering teams. So today, what I want to talk about is testing and how it used to be for my, my experiences in uh, monolith apps. And then I'll talk about how I shifted to microservices at SoundCloud. Um, I'll introduce the concept of contract testing. And then I will talk about PACT specifically as a, an implementation of contract testing and how we use that at SoundCloud. I'll also talk about some caveats and things to notice when you um, integrate this. And then we'll have some time for questions, hopefully. So yeah, let's talk about monoliths. Um, so in my previous experience, uh, it was pretty easy. Um, we had one backend uh, service. It was all in one repository, the backend and front end. Um, at some point, we extracted the front end to its own repository, but it always was just one backend uh, service and one front end, which was the web app. And uh, it was fairly easy to uh, test things to make sure that the API uh, is used correctly. If we wanted to add a new NP API endpoint or change an existing one, it was just a matter of uh, looking through the code or working with that, the front end team and just and make sure that everything uh, doesn't break. And yeah, it was a great time. But things became uh, uh, more complicated when we added more clients to that backend system. So it was uh, iOS and Android, for example. Um, so now we have uh, more clients, and each client has different uh, needs um, from the same endpoints. So the code of this app became more complex. We started adding uh, specific ed endpoints for the specific clients or a lot of conditions for, uh, for each client. So a lot of spaghetti code uh, started uh, uh, appearing here and there. And uh, then it, was, it became like really uh, hard to deploy our backend uh, without, uh, uh, without like causing some damage in uh, one, of, one of these clients. Um, and the way we uh, addressed these problems, uh, well, first of all, we added more manual QA. Uh, so uh, during, towards uh, the deployment, uh, the end of the deployment cy the development cycle, uh, we, we had more uh, accepting tests, manual ones, um, but these proved to be uh, expensive. We need more people. Uh, it was slower and, uh, of course, human error, and it just doesn't scale. So we, it wasn't a matter of adding one more person when we added more uh, endpoints or more complexity to the system. It was exponential. Um, and we also added more end-to-end -end tests, um, but these are quite flaky because it's really hard to, uh, to run those in, in an uh, isolated environment. You actually use the production uh, databases usually, so you need to set up fake users, fake accounts, that kind of stuff. And if uh, the end-to-end -end test doesn't uh, set up and tear down things properly, then things break in the next run of this thing, and you need to go in and you know, poke around and see what breaks and kind of try to jumpstart the whole thing. Um, and they're usually very slow because they really need the entire system up and running. Uh, 
Um, and yeah, it creates uh, bottlenecks. We ended up like uh, uh, prolonging our uh, development cycles just because we couldn't run our tests. So then I uh, joined SoundCloud one and a half years ago, and the first thing I saw was, whoa, microservices. That's so cool. Um, and I joined at a stage where um, th this was a pretty mature uh, state where we already had all the infrastructure in place, um, uh, continuous uh, deployments, uh, logging, monitoring, all this stuff. So um, it was already like pretty uh, stable. Like people really, like, we had small teams, um, uh, very defined uh, 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 boundaries of uh, responsibilities, um, and really teams could develop uh, their services and iterate on those fast um, without having to have like a really long um, cycle. Um, and there was a, a like, clear sense of ownership inside the teams. So I started working on our team's uh, services. And I looked at our testing uh, strategy, and this is true for all of the teams at SoundCloud. So we had a, fair, a very fat layer of unit tests, um, which are easy to run, they're fast. Uh, we have uh, some integration tests. Um, for like uh, when the service works with uh, some external uh, thing like a database or memcache, whatever it is. Um, so we have some integration tests in some of the services. And then there are, there's a, a few end-to-end -end tests, um, usually in the client uh, teams, uh, the ones that develop the web or iOS or Android um, apps. So they have end-to-end -end tests or acceptance tests to make sure that the entire thing works. Um, yes, and this is a fairly uh, common uh, structure. But then I uh, noticed a few, a few months that we have um, outages um, uh, that kind of smell familiar. Like they really uh, look like s stuff that I've seen back when I was developing the monolith. And I took some time to go through um, postmortems that we have. So we used postmortems to uh, uh, review and like um, like document our incidents and uh, make sure that we learn from the mistakes that we've, we've did, we did. So I looked at like uh, a history of one year of uh, postmortems and I saw like 20% um, of these uh, incidents that happened were the result of a broken API. So someone deployed a change in the service and it broke some downstream uh, consu uh, consumer client. And um, I can show you some quotes from, from some postmortems. So the first one is, a lack of uh, trust in the acceptance tests caused us to largely ignore the warnings they generated. The second one is, we couldn't figure out the impact of the broken acceptance tests and assumed the only problem was the test themselves rather than the underlying code. And the third one, uh, the commit went through as there weren't any tests for the serialization from the client to the backend. Um, so this really looked like something that we should be able to resolve. 20% like, uh, is a lot, 20% uh, of the incidents, uh, it's a lot. And um, another, like, uh, I want to talk about uh, contract tests now, but before I go into that, I want to tell you about two more uh, um, use cases where I felt like something is missing. The first one is uh, we had a service uh, where we wanted to deprecate uh, one field in the, like we, we return a list of objects and one of these fields, we wanted to just remove it because uh, we saw a big benefit in um, performance if we just remove it. But uh, it was hard for us to, uh, to understand like who are the clients of, the, of our service and exactly what kind of usage they're making of uh, that endpoint in which we want to deprecate that um, field. So, um, we had to, first of all, find out the, uh, all the services that actually use our uh, service. And then we had to dig in their code. It was during uh, like the holiday season, so there weren't a lot of people around to talk to. Um, so we had to look in their code and see if they are using that field, if they are parsing it, and uh, if they are using it in some way. Um, and then we had to make adapt uh, adaptations in their code to make sure that they're ready for that deprecation. But just to be on the safe side, we also send an email to engineering at SoundCloud 
hey, warning, deprecation notice, we're going to remove that just in case we miss something. And this whole process is very tiresome and you know, really um, uh, prolongs the, the period of time that, until we can actually do that action. Um, the second use case is we have a public API, and that public API still lives uh, partly in our monolith app, and we have a strangling app in front of it, um, so that when traffic comes in for the pub for public API um, uh, endpoints, we either proxy uh, it to our uh, monolith app, or we redirect it to other services that can uh, supply response for that. And um, we had a few incidents in which uh, when we strangled some endpoint, we actually returned uh, the response structure uh, was uh, not entirely the same as the one that used to be in public API. Uh, so we forgot some field or we forgot to uh, support some query parameter in the request. Um, and I really want, want to be able to deal with that situation. I, want, uh, my, I don't want to be able to deploy something uh, that breaks public API. So let's talk about contract tests. Here is what I think about uh, unit tests. Unit tests is kind of like um, you, wake up the, you wake up in the morning, uh, you go through your morning routine, you brush your teeth, you wear clothes and all that, and then just before uh, you leave your house, you look yourself in the mirror and go, you look amazing, yes. Um, and then you just start your day. Um, but what you really want to be doing is um, maybe you want to have your close friends wait for you at the door before you go out uh, and check you out and just then notice like, hey, your shoes are untied or you have something on your chin. Um, so let's go back to, codes, to code. Um, what you usually do right now with, uh, with uh, testing as if I'm developing a service uh, with an API, I'm writing my own tests. So if I have an endpoint for cake, and cake is obviously a lie, um, I have a unit test for that to uh, um, make sure that I'm returning the value that is um, expected. And uh, if I uh, change that uh, response, then my test breaks and everything's fine. That's uh, the part where we look at stuff in the mirror and say, yeah, you look great. Um, but let's look at another case. Let's say we have uh, some, we're using some JSON library to uh, uh, serialize and deserialize um, our, um, our code, our, uh, sorry, our responses. So uh, we have an endpoint slash cake, and we are serializing it with two JSON, and it uses um, underscores for the, um, the keys, current underscore state. And of course, we, we are developers, we like to keep things simple, so we are using the same library, of course, that we have uh, in our dependencies, we use that in our unit tests as well. So we use from JSON to make sure that when we uh, deserialize that call to, for that response from cake, we receive lie. But then let's say that we are upgrading the JSON library or we're changing to a, to a new one, um, and that new library we didn't notice, but it actually uses camel case for keys, and suddenly our our unit tests are useless because they still pass, but we want them to fail. So what we can do is basically the concept of contract testing is instead of having an end-to-end -end test between your consumer, which is the client, the app that is uh, consuming the API, and the provider, which is the app that is supplying that, uh, provides that API, instead of having, having a an end-to-end -end test, which makes you like, have all this thing working at the same time in the same environment. We want to break that into two unit tests, so, um, one that is running on the consumer side and uh, sets expectations uh, from the provider, and uh, then these expectations can be run on the provider side as well as a unit test. And the thing that glues that thing together is the contract. So basically, the consumer will say, I'm, uh, I'm going to send this and, this and that request, and I expect this and that response, and this will be recorded somehow, and uh, the provider can replay that and make sure that it um, holds these uh, expectations. So for example, if you go back to the example we had before, um, the consumer will say, um, I'm requesting slash cake, I expect a JSON response uh, with the key current underscore state, and then the consumer can go on to 
uh, have its assertions for uh, how it uh, deserializes the, the response, um, just like in a unit test. And on the provider side, we just uh, we take this file and we verify that, um, yeah, when someone calls slash cake, I'm returning a JSON with current underscore state. Um, so I want to talk about Pact. So uh, yeah, I wanted to like find a solution for how to implement uh, contract testing, and um, I did some research. We did some research in our team. Um, we looked at uh, maybe implementing our own solution for that. Uh, it, like, we did like a POC of that, but it seemed uh, kind of limited and um, and expensive in terms of uh, uh, time that will take us to to bring it to a place where it's really useful. And um, I also looked at different implementations out there. Um, and the one that seemed uh, the most uh, uh, mature is Pact. So what is Pact? Pact is a family of frameworks that are designed for contract testing. Um, there exist uh, uh, implementations in different languages, like all the popular ones. Um, and it mainly supports uh, JSON over HTTP. Um, and I, I will mention that a bit later. And uh, the idea is that, as I said, you run tests locally, so you don't have any external dependencies on others on upstream or downstream services. Um, so the way it works, the, on the consumer side, you have your packed framework installed, and you uh, rec record uh, HTTP requests and responses uh, against the packed framework, and this will be uh, recorded into a packed file, uh, which we'll see a bit later. And then on the provider side, uh, these requests will be replayed by the packed framework installed on the provider service and uh, verified, and the response will be, will be verified by, by Pact. Um, yeah. So what I want to do now is uh, show you uh, a small example of how this looks um, in in our environment, and uh, specifically, I want to show you how uh, we're uh, taking an existing uh, unit test on the consumer and um, um, converting it into a packed uh, contract test because we want to make sure that we're not duplicating our unit tests. We want to make sure that we're still testing what we wanted, but not like adding too much, uh, too much extra code and duplicity. Um, and the code will be in uh, Scala, but it's really simple stuff, don't worry. Um, so let's say we have a consumer, and that consumer is uh, working against a, a service called likes. Uh, the likes service is a service that allows uh, someone to like a track and unlike a track, and you can also get a list of likes per user or a track, etc. And so let's assume that uh, this consumer uh, needs to get uh, to fetch a list of likes for a user. So it has this um, uh, method called get likes for. It uh, receives a user. Let's say it's, an, a, a, it's a, a long ID, um, and it returns a list of likes. And it uses some HTTP client. Um, it sends a get request to likes slash uh, the user ID. And then it looks at the response. And it does one of three things. So if it's a, uh, it's a 200 OK, then it takes the body and it parses that um, and uh, the, the, the JSON and returns a list of likes. Um, again, the implementation is not uh, important right now. Um, if it was a 404 not found, then it returns an empty list. And if it's something else, then it, it throws an exception. Not the best thing to do, but it's fine for this example. So at the moment, um, for this uh, client code, we have this uh, unit test. So we're using uh, specs2 in Mokito to uh, create test doubles for, uh, for HTTP client. So yeah, we have a, a test double for HTTP client. And we are creating a new instance, a new instance of this likes service uh, uh, class, and uh, then uh, we are uh, mocking uh, request to uh, request uh, to the get method in the HTTP client. So, if uh, the code, uh, if if there's a request to get likes slash a thousand, then we'll return an uh, an OK status and some JSON fixture. Uh, 
And if there is a request to likes slash 2000, then we'll return a 404. And then we have the, the assertions here, uh, just simple ones for that matter. If there are likes, then I expect a call to get likes for 1000 to return two likes. And when I call get likes for 2000, um, I expect zero likes. So this is what our unit tests currently look like. Let's see how we uh, turn that into a packed contract test. So the first step is uh, to build a, something called a packed fragment. I'm using packed JVM here. This is uh, the implementation of packed for any JVM language, which you can use uh, for Java, Scala. Uh, you can even use it for Android apps if you want. Um, so what we do here is, first of all, we define, uh, we give names to our cons uh, consumer and provider. So in this case, our consumer is my consumer, and the provider is likes. And then we define list of interactions, which are uh, what we talked about before, the, uh, the expectations um, of the consumer from the provider. So we have two interactions that we're defining. Uh, the first one, which is similar to that uh, test double that we had before, uh, where we uh, want to return a, some JSON fixture in a 200 OK if the request is for likes slash 1,000. So, um, we have something called uh, state, and uh, I'll talk about this later, uh, but the state will be user 1000 has liked two tracks, so that's like the state that we uh, expect to exist. And given that uh, uh, we request, uh, we fetch a list of likes, then uh, the, requ the request will be a get to likes slash 1000, and uh, the response will be a 200 with some JSON fixture, which is pretty similar to that uh, test double, double that we uh, defined before with Mokito. And the second example is similar uh, to the second uh, mock that we had. So in this case, user 2000 has liked no tracks. Um, when we fetch a list of likes, um, the request will be, be a get request, to likes slash 2000, and the response will be a 404. So what we did now is defined the expectations of the consumer from the provider. And now we can go ahead and uh, have our uh, tests, which is basically quite similar to what we've seen before, with one, one uh, exception. Um, the HTTP client is a real HTTP client instance, uh, but, instead of, uh, but uh, and instead of mocking it, uh, we're creating a new instance we're using something called provider config URL. Um, when the uh, test is running, what the PAC framework, what PAC JVM does is uh, it instantiates um, a mock provider on some port and localhost, and that will be supplied in that URL. And that mock provider will, what it will know to do is uh, to uh, to uh, re to answer the requests uh, that we defined here with these responses. So we have a real instance of HTTP client, and we have a like service now. And now we have basically the same assertions that we had before, only now instead of working against a uh, test double, um, a mock test double, we are working against this mock provider. Um, what's my next one? Yes. And so once uh, this test runs, um, two things happen. As I said, a mock provider is instantiated and the tests are running against that. Um, and there's also a verification that we're actually using uh, these endpoints. So for example, if uh, here I would have uh, that second assertion off, I will just uh, cross that uh, or uh, comment that out so we are not calling the 2000 uh, endpoint, then the test will fail. So there is actually a verification that I'm actually using that in my client. And what we see here is the packed uh, file that is generated uh, from these, um, assertion, th these expectations that we've defined, the packed fragment. Um, so it's very similar to what, we, to what we've seen. We have the provider name and, co and consumer defined here. And then we have the interactions. So we have the provider state, which again, I'll talk to you soon, about soon. Um, we have the description as we re we've written it, and then we have the requests and the response. So then on the provider side, basically what we want to do is we want to collect all of uh, the pack files uh, from all of our consumers. 
um, and we want to verify them with the packed framework that is installed, is installed on the provider. So uh, one, one important thing to, to notice is that um, we have to make sure that our provider environment is isolated. So the provider might be working again with uh, some database, um, or it might be using some upstream services to, uh, to verify things while, like, when getting some requests. Or, for example, the like service might be using a user service uh, to verify that uh, the user for which we wanted uh, to get likes for actually exists. Um, so uh, what we do is we dockerize. Um, we have containers. Uh, for any uh, third party, any external uh, dependencies. And uh, we have test doubles uh, for upstream services. So, for example, we use uh, Wiremock or um, uh, Stubby4j uh, to create these um, uh, test doubles. So, that way, we make sure that we don't repeat the mistakes of end to end tests where we have flaky information. So, our provider um, environment is really isolated. So, uh, yeah, that's the idea. Um, but let's go back to talking about provider states. So, yes, we want to make sure that when, uh, when a request comes in to uh, fetch all the likes of user 1000, we actually get uh, two, uh, two likes back. Um, but since we're using a, like a local uh, contained uh, database, uh, who says this user actually exists and we can actually provide that? Um, so Pact has this uh, really uh, cool feature called provider states, which is basically a way uh, to get the provider to do a setup um, uh, for each uh, request that comes in. And uh, this is, uh, um, this is Pact specification version 2. In version 3, it's more structured. But basically, in version 2, uh, it's a free text. And this is something that it will let uh, your provider team and consumer team will agree on. Um, and so basically what the provider would do is uh, when it sees like a provider state uh, user 1000 has like two tracks, what it can do is actually set up this data to be available so that when the request comes in, it'll have something to return. And same for two, user 2000. So let's look uh, at the example. So um, when we run the verification step on the provider side, uh, the packed framework will uh, like uh, tell the likes app, please set the state to user thousand has like two tracks. And what the likes app can do is insert some likes into the database. Um, and then, only then, the packed framework will send the uh, HTTP request for uh, likes slash uh, thousand, in which case the likes app can actually return the likes that it just inserted. Um, and the same goes for uh, the, second, um, the second expectation, where we want user 2000 to have no likes, so we just delete the, uh, the likes for that user. Um, so yes, let's talk about how we actually centralize these uh, packed files. So you can basically just move these around with um, emails and Slack or whatever, uh, but that's hardly uh, maintainable and uh, scalable. So. Uh, one of the cool tools out there is, is called the Pact Broker, which is basically like an artifact manager for Pact files. Um, it has a, a, a web app, a, a really nice UI, um, and, uh, and a really nice API so that Pact frameworks can integrate with it. So they can, be, uh, for example, fetch all of the Pact files uh, that exist for a, a certain provider. And also supports the uh, versioning and tagging. And I'll show you an example of how we use it at SoundCloud. And uh, so uh, this is basically what the, the UI looks like when you load uh, the pack broker. So you can see uh, all the relationships that exist between consumers and providers in your uh, network. Um, and each one of those means that there is, there is a pack file for, uh, for this consumer and provider. And there's also a, uh, like if you click uh, click through that one of those, then you can see a uh, nice uh, view of um, all these interactions that are defined in that pack file. So we've seen that pack file before. It's just a JSON, but here it's broken down um, and it'll be a little bit more elegant, um, yeah, and browsable. And there's also a view where you can see uh, the network uh, of all these uh, all of your services. So you can see who consumes uh, which, uh, which service. 
Um, so more or less how we use that uh, in our uh, uh, CD pipeline. Um, so on the consumer side, uh, when we push some change, we have a pull request, for example, um, and after we merge that, I'm like, this is just a master pipeline. We have also a pull request pipeline, but this is the master pipeline. Once we merge a pull request, um, we have our tests running and stuff, but, we also, uh, but then we have a step uh, for uh, generating the consumer contracts, which basically is running the tests that we've seen before. And uh, then we deploy that consumer, and only after this is deployed, uh, we upload the packs to the broker and we tag them with production. So we know that uh, the expectations that we just changed uh, on the consumer, uh, these, uh, these expectations are now really in production. So there's a match between those. And uh, when we want to, uh, to, to deploy uh, the provider, we, when, uh, something, when the new change is pushed, uh, we verify, we fetch all the prod tagged uh, packs from Pack Broker, and uh, once this passes, we can safely deploy. Again, of course, we have other steps. Um, okay, so let's talk about caveats. So first of all, communication is, uh, is essential here. So the fact that you're auto automating something here doesn't mean that uh, you don't need to have a conversation between the teams about um, the changes that you're making in your API. Uh, what Pact and contract testing allows you is to facilitate these changes or these um, uh, and new endpoints into something more structured that can be automated and like, tested um, and iterated on. So, but still, there, there must be a communication uh, between the teams. It's about setting the states, as we talked before, uh, setting, uh, understanding exactly what the, the endpoint needs to do, um, and so on. Um, another point is that basically when, when you add the, the stuff, you're adding more moving parts to your system. So uh, we have the pack broker now that we need to maintain. And uh, we have uh, new frameworks, that uh, dependencies that we have in our stack. Um, but uh, at the same time, we need to remember that we are uh, eventually also, uh, we're deprecating some end-to-end -end tests. So we're taking out some flaky stuff out of the system, so that's good. Um, it's also like a learning curve to learn how to use the uh, Pact in general and spe the specific framework for uh, for each platform. Um, it's uh, yeah, like just like it's a matter of like understanding uh, what it means to write a contract test and uh, uh, what makes a contract test good and understand the boundaries of that and what how you should and should not use that that new tool. Um, and there are good resources about it in uh, pack.io. Um, and some of the frameworks that, uh, that, uh, that are implemented uh, are still a work in progress. Um, personally, uh, I've uh, already like, pushed some bug fixes and, uh, and features into pack.jvm. Um, pack.jvm specifically, is, I, I think it's very well structured and uh, easy to... Uh, um, to iterate on, uh, but definitely there are things, more things to do there. Um, so that's one thing to take into account. Um, yeah, and one important thing to remember is uh, Postel's law. So basically you want to be uh, conservative uh, in what you send. So as a consumer, I don't want uh, my provider to expect some query parameter that maybe in the future I'm going to need support for. I want to be strict about, yeah, this is the only thing that I want to, uh, I want to provide to be aware of that I'm using. Uh, and you also want to be liberal um, about what you accept. So uh, if you're hitting the user's service um, and you're just uh, parsing the whole uh, thing, uh, but you're actually just using the user's name and uh, roles, for example, then don't do that. Uh, just uh, make sure that you're only parsing and using um, and defining in the expectations in the, in the packed file only the fields that you're actually using. Um, yes, and there's uh, definitely um, some time going into uh, setting, setting up the provider uh, side of things. So I mentioned that it, sh it should be isolated, uh, and uh, we sometimes have uh, complex states to set there. Uh, 
Um, and yes, it's a bit time consuming, but we've also noticed that m most, uh, s most consumers have um, a very uh, identical, like it's fairly similar use of the same provider. Um, so it means that we only uh, need to define this whole thing once and then uh, any, any consumer can implement their contract test against that provider and there's no more work to do there. And um, one more thing. Uh, that uh, I did not uh, have a chance to, like we, di we didn't really solve that problem yet, um, is automating consumer-triggered provider verification. What I mean by that is, uh, let's uh, imagine a situation where um, we are implementing a new endpoint in a, in a provider, in a service, and uh, we have a consumer for that that is waiting for that endpoint to be ready in production. And uh, we want to make sure that we're not deploying that consumer that like this version of the consumer that depends on that new endpoint before the provider is in production with that endpoint ready. Um, so basically, what we want to do is uh, have in the in the pipeline of the consumer a uh, rule that says something like uh, that it it needs to like trigger the verification um, of the provider, and that needs to pass before the consumer can deploy. So this kind of dependency is something that we did not resolve yet. And I would be happy to talk to anyone here yeah, about this problem. Um, and one last thing is adoption. So as I mentioned, we have more than 300 services. And this whole thing will not work if you, we only have one contract test between two services that are managed inside just one team. Um, so uh, we, we put a lot of effort into uh, educating people, working with people, understanding their needs. Uh, we have uh, some workshops uh, set up um, for individuals or for teams that uh, are interested in implementing contract tests. And we have a Slack channel for that, for support, and some information in our internal wiki. Um, so yeah, so this is definitely one, one thing that is always hard to do. Uh, get your new technology in there and like, convince people that this is the next thing. Um, so let's do a small recap of what PACT is. So we have uh, consumers that write contract tests. Um, they publish, they generate uh, PACT files from these tests. These are published uh, to the PACT broker. And uh, then we have uh, providers verifying uh, the PACTs that are relevant to them. Uh, and you must remember that providers themselves are also consumer, consumers of other services. So Providers are also writing contract tests, and yeah, that's about it. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Are there any questions? Hey, uh, thanks Hi. for the talk. Uh, how many of your uh, microservices are already pactified? So, how many packs do you have at SoundCloud? Good question. Um, I think we, uh, pr on the provider side, we have uh, support for verifying. Uh, we have, um, I want to say, five or six. Uh, this is a fairly uh, early project, and we're still working on this. Uh, but on the consumer side, like we, uh, these five um, provider services, um, I think, have uh, like uh, ten or fifteen consumers. So yeah, we have so each one of these uh, providers are verifying like three or four or five um, contract tests. Hey, Alan, thank you. Um, so you were saying communication is key, and right now, beside of educating all the people and all the teams, what is the like the biggest challenge in negotiate the contracts itself? Um, so, if I understand the question correctly, are you uh, asking about um, how to define the API itself, or exactly? So, is it like does it really force you guys to talk to the other teams, and is that like better than before, or is it like giving you more like pressure to against the teams, like oh th these guys changed APIs again and now forcing us to make contracts or whatever they mean there? So uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, so some some of uh, so the, the way we work is kind of an uh, inner source. I think that was that term was mentioned in this uh, conference already. Um, basically, um, different teams can contribute code to um, other repositories that are outside of their uh, team scope. 
Um, and uh, this means that if I want to make a change in my API, I, I would look at what's going to fail in my consumers, and I would go and uh, pitch that uh, change uh, as a pull request on the consumer, uh, usually. But uh, um, I'm trying to think if I answer your question. Yep. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Um, do you know of any um, frameworks um, to use uh, contract-based testing for asynchronous operations, um, like with message brokers for reactive microservices? Um, interesting question. So, um, are you talking about like in-process messaging or like, no? Like yeah. So distributed. Yeah. So, uh, Pact actually supports in, in version three of its specifications. It supports. Um, um, you're writing a contract test for uh, for messages. Oh, nice. Uh, yes, I have no experience with that yet, and uh, definitely I think um, that there's still room for. Like I, I mentioned, that not all the frameworks in all languages are uh, you know uh, stable and like uh, up to date with features. I think uh, it's more uh, about like V3 where messages are supported, and yeah, it's definitely something that needs to be explored. Great. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Um, I see the PACT providers very useful, and um, there are, um, the PACT frameworks are often in an early stage or not available for some languages or some frameworks and so on. And what I would like to see is combining the PACT provider with um, service virtualization tools like Wiremark and Mount a Bank or whatever. Um, with, this, sorry, I for, I... To combine the PACT provider with uh, vir service virtualization like Wiremock or mm. something like that. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever try something like that? Or? I haven't. It's actually an interesting approach. I would love to talk to you about this if you want later. <laughs> OK. Thanks. Um, when you are deploying in your pipeline, the provider verifies against the pack that its consumers have submitted to the broker. Correct. And by this, you could I have the problem that somebody is externally is breaking your build? So that's the idea. Basically, you want that to happen. You want to uh, make sure that you're not deploying something uh, if, like, you're not making a change, um, or yeah, like if someone start using a new endpoint or like making like a change in the way they're consuming uh, your service. If they're making a change, you want uh, you don't want to. Uh, deploy your provider because that might break that, right? Yeah, but do you make any verification that this is, has already been um, deployed to production before someone puts on this into your broker? Oh, yeah, I understand your question. Um, I, I think I mentioned that point. Uh, this is like this cycle where um, I, I want to deploy my consumer, which maybe changed the way it consumes that uh, something from the provider, but I wanted to verify that the provider is verified before in deploying, right? So you, I don't want the consumer to deploy and say, yeah, yeah, now I'm using this new thing, deal with it, right? Uh, and this is something that we haven't uh, solved yet. Hey, uh, I wonder if there's some metric for your initiative in introducing PACT, so there's some costs involved with PACTifying all your services. And is there a metric you're tracking on what will improve about your development cycle when you have PACTified all the things? So what will disappear? What, what benefits will you get? Yeah, um, we haven't set uh, any KPIs for that yet. Our uh, test and build team is uh, thinking about this uh, question. Um, but I think um, we do want to we, we do want to see a decrease in number of uh, outages uh, or incidents that happen because of an API that was broken, which is something we can just look at uh, data in our postmortems um, and. Uh, I think that's one of the things that we want we can measure. Hi, uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first is, if it's possible to use PEC for generating some kind of uh, API documentation? Yeah, um, yeah, it's a good question. Actually, there is uh, an interesting uh, work 
an integration of uh, Pact with, um, I'm really bad with names. Uh, there's like a documentation uh, framework, uh, very, yes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, and there's an interesting uh, work of like uh, creating some integration between between those to create this better documentation. But um, I've I've uh, showed you like in Pack Broker, like you have this thing. Basically, this is a live documentation yeah. of uh, of your API. Uh, so an actual like examples of how consumers are using your API. Um, and not just like what the provider thinks they should be using, but the actual use cases. Yeah, uh, thanks. And the uh, second question is if it's possible to, like during the testing, the consumer, if it's possible to uh, test against like two versions, like that. Um, if Are you I'm talking about, sorry, I'm talking about the consumer side or provider side? Well, it's if I'm. Deploying a new, a new, for example, provider, mm -hmm. and I uh, need to verify that it's able to communicate with uh, older and yeah. uh, newer version. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, and this is where uh, we use uh, tagging in Pack Broker. So I mentioned I, I didn't go through the whole process of our uh, pipeline, but. I, um, I mentioned that we're using the prod tag, um, but w in our uh, pull request uh, pipeline, we're uh, verifying also the latest version. So yeah, that's the idea. So that we can check that we're um, on top of everything, basically. Uh, one question here. Yeah. So how often uh, happens that uh, you can deploy your provider because a client is misusing the, your provider. So it expects something that is um, not there, and you can deploy your provider because the client is wrong and expects something else. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Can you repeat that? So if, if I look at the diagram, the client is uh, basically defining how the provider should work. Yeah, no? uh, the diagram in the end? Yeah. Like, uh, this one? Yes. Yes. So when you deploy, it's like, it's like not the pipeline. It's just the like uh, the life cycle of mm -hmm. tests. But yeah. Please but when continue. you when you want to test the provider, you are running tests based on client specifications, right? Correct. Uh, so how often happens that the client uh, they have a different code base and they just define a new endpoint that you don't even have? And yeah. because of that, you can deploy your provider. Yeah, um, so far it didn't happen. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and uh, again, I'm uh, referring you to what I uh, talked about earlier. Like this, this like uh, uh, dependency of a consumer, uh, the consumer pipeline on the uh, provider verification. This kind of loop is something that we haven't closed yet. And did you think maybe a single repository where you just hold this? Um, Contracts might be solved the issue. Like you uh, both agreed on something and you tag, and this is what you use. I, no, sorry, I didn't understand. If, if you, you might have just a single repository for these contracts, and so when whenever you change a contract, both teams yeah. are really agree with this. Yeah, and this is about communication. And Pack Broker basically gives you that repository of like all the uh, pack files. Um, um, and uh, we definitely rely on communication between the teams uh, to make sure that, yeah, we, we do, don't like tell people to just deal with it, you know? Yeah. Thanks. Sure. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you.